freedom is so important. It's our freedom of religion, our freedom to raise our children how we would like to raise them, uh, our, you know, our freedom to follow what's in our hearts and, and be ourselves and accept each other. We don't have to like everything the other person does. And you're never going to find somebody that's exactly like you on every issue. And why would you want to? Like, you can just sit alone. Like, it's amazing to be able to build a community and to have friends. And so that's what's so important. And God gave me this child to, to teach him because... He trusted me and and I want to be the one who's raising my child. I don't necessarily trust this government enough to give my child over to them. I've started to realize like how immensely like powerful and uh, important women's intuition is to society, to a good society. And our society has just, you know, destroyed women's in intuition and said like you need to outsource everything like outsource to the teachers outsource to the doctor like we'll make the decisions and you do it you, you don't feel good about it like there's something you wrong gotta with trust you the experts, <laughs> right? yeah, trust the experts trust the science hello beautiful faces welcome to teaching liberty my name is stephanie edmonds to live free you have to think free and i'm sitting next to a woman who really helps me enact that principle in my everyday life natalie thank you so much for joining me thank you for having me yeah um, i'm really excited because you've recently published a book the yes. most beautiful boy the most beautiful girl in the world and it is a beautiful book um, both just how it's made and the content of it. And I think it's just so reflective of what we're trying to create here, what you're trying to create here. And I'm so grateful to, to be a part of it. And I want to share it with the world. Uh, so I thought we would start. You just published this book. You're an author in addition to being a mom. So just tell us a little bit about yourself, why you published this book and what your parenting philosophy is. Great. So this book, it was something that just came out of the blue for me. I woke up and wrote this down one day and then wanted to make a book out of it. Um, I thought it would be a nice children's book. And I was really looking for an author. Eventually I found an author, an uh, illustrator. Eventually I found an amazing illustrator and we put this baby together and I wanted wholesome content. I'm just, I cannot believe sometimes what they put out there for children. Um, I sometimes watch what's out there and I'm like, who are these sickos? It's violence. Sometimes it's grooming and it's so inappropriate that I, uh, I wanted something better. And um, this was just, this is just my little, you know, step in that right direction. This just came from me from my heart it's based on kind of like how I like to live how I like to parent and it's based on a, like a loving philosophy I think that my parenting philosophy is just like what if a child was loved <laughs> just loved <laughs> what if there was children that didn't have trauma I mean everyone's gonna have something um, everything's relative but like what if I just really tried to make it so that my child can can feel their feelings that they can feel loved like what kind of child would that create and I think that there's a debate in our culture and there's a big part of the culture that thinks that you know authoritarian parenting is the way to go and I'm not I'm not here to judge really what other people are doing um, it's just I think that everything, the, one of the only ways I survive is say that we come to this world, everything is here and we get to choose. And I choose things that are kind and loving, especially for children. I just kind of have a dream for like warm, happy childhoods. And so the authoritarian parenting versus kind of that gentle parenting and, and an authoritarian parent might say that I'm creating a snowflake, but I will <laughs> rebut that with, I don't think snowflakes come from being loved. I don't, I even don't even believe the term, oh, you're spoiling your child. I don't think you spoil your child with love or hugs or attention. 
I think that when you give a child love and hugs and attention, they become so strong because they are strong within themselves and they really can weather things. They're not as triggered and they're not projecting as often. Um, so that's kind of just briefly my why I wrote the book and uh, my parenting style. But in addition just to the, about what the book is about, um, it's just really about children. I wanted to tell children, I think what they hear when they're young, kind of before seven, they're in that hypnotic state, and I want them to get, I think what runs through your head, what the parents are kind of putting into your world, or like what what is going through you at all times, and, and, and that kind of determines like how you feel inside and I want children I want to feel and I want children to feel kind of a peace inside and I want them to feel good about themselves and so this kind of it's almost like affirmations where you know it tells them that you know at the end there's a mirror and it says you're the most beautiful child and then someone might say oh well that's too much based on looks but the book is just really all about you know, there's a page that talks about how loved the child is, and there's a page that talks about, like, it's in, this, in the girl one, it's easy for her to be brave when she is scared, to send love where love is lost, to choose love over fear, to remember how incredibly divine she is, to know that all works in her favor, to create from her heart, and to live life as a celebration of bliss. And I so. love the <laughs> illustrations. All of the illustrations are so beautiful. And just the book itself, it, it has like a good feel to it when you pick it up. You can tell it was made with love. And I can independently confirm that your philosophy that you're professing here is very much in line how you live your everyday life and how you create the space for our children to be nurtured and to learn and to grow. And you're right. I, I certainly think there's a lot of space between an authoritarian parent and a gentle parent where you're giving kids space to struggle with some of those uh, difficult coming of age experiences to work out problems among themselves, but knowing that they have somebody who they can always come to, that they don't have to be scared of, you know, they did um, something that was, you know, inappropriate, whether they you know, called their friend a name or hit somebody or whatever the situation is that you get into when you're a little kid, they know that they can always come to you. And, uh, and we, even sometimes when we talk about things, you know, you're like, oh, I would have done this. And I'm like, well, that's not exactly what I would have done. But I feel like that's the beauty, though, of also the space that you create. We don't, we're, we can be like-minded without being a hundred percent the same person um, and I think it's good for the kids too to have some variation uh, in the types of adults who are nurturing them and helping them grow. I totally agree and that's another thing about just trying not to be judgmental I mean I think we choose it's like I choose this and obviously I choose it because I think it's the right way and I have my opinions on why it's the right way but I hugely believe that God gave us each our own children so it's like I'm not the best parent for your child when your child is here and you know I'm working with him or there's an issue then I'm going to handle it the best way and with the best care and there's a trust there that does that and I think with each you know each time a child calls another child a name or you know, makes a mistake and, you know, is physical with another child, we can teach them that that was a mistake and that we make mistakes. And, and sometimes even as adults, we make mistakes. Yeah. And there's a huge lesson in being able to, like, I admit that I made a mistake. That's what I know. Sometimes parents get upset. I try not to yell at all. I, there's no, definitely no violence against the children as far as, like, physical. But, like, I lost my cool and, like, yelled at my four-year-old I mean he pushed me <laughs> he pushed me right he pushed me there yeah but uh I yelled at him and then you're like and then especially for me because I don't want to be doing that that's not my philosophy but I do it and then I feel awful but I apologize to him and that's something the no I don't remember an adult 
ever for anything sitting down and like apologizing to me. And so, you know, I'm sorry that I yelled, I made a mistake. And I think that then when the children are in situations where they're pushed and they don't know how to manage their emotions and maybe they yell or call a name or maybe at that age they can't control their bodies as much yet. And they right. Especially if physical. they're tired or, yeah. you know, haven't eaten or these other things. Yes. And so they'll, you know, something will happen and they, it's nice, you know, there's so many lessons there. There's forgiveness, right. there's we all make mistakes, not just forgiving the other person, but also forgiving ourselves. And also, you know, what about, you know, this child does something not nice, and then this child does something not nice, and then it continues on in this kind of like this negative spiral. But like, what if you break the spiral? What if you say, I have compassion for the other child who's in that situation, and I'm gonna. I'm trying to teach them like, hey, if they do something wrong, that has nothing to do with you. That's their problem. Right. So you don't have to do something wrong because they do something wrong. And then you can kind of break that negative cycle. And I'm like, what if we started creating positive cycles? What if we started creating a cycle where it's like, I'm really nice to my friend. And what happens then when you guys do that all the time and you build these amazing friendships and these boys are gonna build these friendships and they're gonna have lifelong friends where they've gone through bad things and they've learned to work through things and they've gone through, um, you know, and then they started to create really amazing good memories together as well. And so that's, you know, there's just different ways to do that. But if I'm just, you know, or what, you know, what if I come in then as the parent, that child calls that child a name, that child, call, and then I call them both names. Right. <laughs> you're bad boy, you know, you're mm -hmm. bad boys. And then how, I don't, that for me doesn't, doesn't resonate as what I choose to do with the children. I choose to kind of try to bring it to a positive cycle. So a forgiveness cycle. Um, and that's like a choosing, I think a lot of times the attacking or, you know, you're trying to control it because you're like, oh, this is so bad, you know, mm -hmm. bad. And, and that's a fear. So it's a love. I feel like that's a, just one example of like choosing love over fear um, and choosing forgiveness. Forgiveness is the path to salvation, they say. And, uh, I think that that you know that's true, and to try to teach that, model is, that, model yeah. that. I definitely sometimes <laughs> say things, and I'm like, I don't remember my mom saying this exact thing, <laughs> but it feels like this is something that my mom would say, you know. And it's not a, a bad thing necessarily, but just, um, it's just I, I definitely am with you. And your kids are soaking up everything you do, whether they're conscious of it or not conscious of it. I think it's always hilarious. Caleb will sometimes take my glasses and put them on and he'll be like, oh, I'm mini Stephanie. And then he'll like do and say all the things that I do <laughs> that and act like me. And he's very accurate. <laughs> <laughs> too accurate. Yes, sometimes it's too accurate. Um, a little self-reflection is uh, forced upon you in those moments. Uh, and I certainly try to have those conversations with my son when we have you know, a stressful time, a difficult morning or something like that. Usually we try to decompress, talk about it and apologize and talk about how we'll do better next time. And I wanted to talk about um, just why you're going down this path. A lot of the things that we're talking about, I was a teacher, I worked in, in the public school system and Caleb went to public school for a year and these are all the things they talk about They're, oh you know we need social emotional learning and every individualized learner but when you're put in this space you're assigned to this space with 24 kids you may or may not know or 18 whatever the class size is a teacher who you were assigned to and it's it's just not the same. You don't have that relationship and you can't actually create that organic space to implement those things at scale in, in a public school, even perhaps in a private school. Um, so just talk about what made you decide to remove yourself from I, whether the public system or the, the private school, traditional schooling system and say, we're gonna create our own space here for our kids. 
Yeah, so we chose to homeschool starting 2020. There was, I kind of had a feeling like I wanted to homeschool even before that happened because I have one child. Um, it was it's difficult for us to have him. So like, he's like our pride and joy. And I love being a mother and I, I love spending time with him. So the idea that it was like, the bus is gonna come at 8.30 and he's gonna come at, back at 4.30 at five years old, it was like, I don't have a baby anymore. And it's kind of like we moved to this area with these high taxes and these amazing schools. Not, I don't wanna, not to, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't choose the schools, but I don't necessarily but that's need what they, to put them right. down. The, the, I just guess I, I disagree that they're an amazing place for ch my child. We moved here for these, these schools that are called amazing. And, um, you know, it was kind of like my husband's like, well, he's going to go. <laughs> and, and it didn't feel what, right. You know, and I think even at that time, I think things have changed a lot in the last few years where I've started to realize like how immensely like powerful and uh, important women's intuition is to society, to a good society. And our society has just, you know, destroyed women's in intuition and said like you need to outsource everything like outsource to the teachers outsource to the doctor like we'll make the decisions and you do it y you don't feel good about it like there's something you wrong with trust you the experts, <laughs> yeah, right? trust the experts trust the science like we are so I mean in a way I feel like women have kept our babies alive <laughs> For, that's how we've gotten here you know it, it, there, there's something to women's intuition and I, I parented intuitively uh, and I feel like it, it was you know it, it worked for me really well and uh, so we so then you know 2020 happens and we cannot uh, I, you know, we were out of school and all the teachers wrote letters saying that masks were dangerous and uh, I didn't want my three year old in a mask. Oh, wait, that they they were dangerous or they had to or COVID was dangerous. So they had to wear masks. The teachers wrote letters to the state saying masks were dangerous oh, okay. and they were against, against the it. children wearing masks. It was bad for their social development. Okay. Um, Probably it's scary for the children. I mean, all the things. So your everybody, school agreed. Your school, school was like they shouldn't be the in masks. The school thought that. I mean, because it's like, in my opinion, common sense that we should not wear masks. That the science, the actual sciences, don't work, and we definitely shouldn't put them on our children for, um, you know, something the media created. But that's a whole nother, <laughs> yeah, a whole nother yeah. episode. But. But the teachers said these are dangerous. That is what all their letters said. They promised me they would never put them on the young children. They, they thought it was abhorrent, not going to happen. Ned Lamont writes a letter, three and above, need to wear a mask. And then they do it. The teachers did it. They did to the children what they said was dangerous. And for me, I said, why are you, I'm like, why would you do something you know is dangerous for the children? And it's like, they're worried about getting shut down. And I'm like, well, like you care more about keeping your school open than you care about the safety of the children and, and actually doing something that is dangerous to them. And then even how they presented the mask, then we're like, oh, and now, you know, the children, I pulled my son right away, but some people kept their children there and and, you know, it was like, oh, the mask, we're going to hang it on the hook. And it's like, it became this good thing. And then the children right. start, like, having an attachment and, like, a, a, a so love weird. for the mask, yeah. a love for covering. I have to, and <laughs> they, in, so this would have been the second year of the 2021, right? He, Caleb went into kindergarten and they, in the first few days, they did this thing about, like, why I wear my mask. And it was, like, this coloring thing. When that came home... I called the school and I flipped out <laughs> and I was like, this is propaganda. This, you know, if there's like an individual kid who I was against the policy, but it, it was what it was. And I wasn't in the place where I could pull him at that time. But 
he, I was like, if there's an individual kid that you need to like talk to or something to introduce them to, the, you don't need to propaga propagandize the whole class. Like anything that was mildly related to COVID protocols, the principal called me. <laughs> and they're like, we're doing this thing. We're sending home COVID tests. Do you want one? I was like, yeah, I want to see what they're, I want to see what they're giving away with my taxpayer dollars, please. The tests that don't work apparently. <laughs> yeah, right. But, um, but someone made a lot of money. So we pulled them out. Because it was the mask that really, and it and it was helpful to me because my husband could see that what was going on. Yeah, it was like the visual something wasn't representation, right with yeah. everything that was coming at us from the media. Something wasn't right with the storyline. Um, something wasn't right with the teachers doing something to harm the children because they don't want to get shut down or like what if they're just following gets orders, sick, right? you know? And so. But he was just going to start at the public school and in kindergarten, and uh, I got to pull, you know, I got to pull him out, and so it was like he never had that experience. And then once you pull your child out and you get into the community and the rhythm of homeschool, and you start talking to the people who have homeschooled for a long time, you realize that this isn't the first time there's propaganda being taught to our children. Um, you know, this what what are the motivations between behind a lot of things that are being taught? And one of the main things for me that I don't love about public schools that I just even remember as someone who you know went to public school, I studied engineering at a very good uh, college, and then I went to law school, and I did all I worked so hard, and and I didn't learn anything about like what makes me happy. It was just all about getting this job, this like law firm job that so I could like take a car to work and like work in a big building, but it was so unfulfilling for me. And I never thought about like, oh, what does Natalie like to do? And when I stopped working as an attorney and um, it, I was I kind of had a little bit of time to be like, oh, what do I like to do? And I never even thought about that. Nobody was ever even like, well, what does Natalie enjoy, you know, enjoy? It was just like, oh, go study engineering. You'll be able to get a job. People will think you're smart. Like, go to law school. You'll get a great job. We're so proud. You know, your parents are bragging about you. And, and you get the job. And it was like my dream. You know, I got a job at a big law firm in the city. And I thought it was so, I thought I was so cool because of that. And it was really my identity was caught up in that. And, um, and so then when you leave that, then it's like, who am I and what do I like? And, and, I, and now that I understand that a little, I mean, there's a lot of concepts there, but what I just really want for my child is for him to know himself. And I want him to be motivated from a place in his heart. And the whole school system is, is set up in a way where an external source says like, oh, you're a good child because you copied what we told you to say. You know, you regurgitated the answers in the right way. And so you're good. You're good with here's an A. There's that instant gratification. You get to feel good, good about or, yourself. Or bad, right? Like if or you're bad not if good you're at not it. good yeah. at it. Yes. So I was pretty good at that. Um, and being a girl... <laughs> School is easier for girls, right? More Absolutely. obedient. We can sit in place. Absolutely. Whereas it's a well, I, I actually don't even think I was good. I think I'm more of like a learn someone who has to do to actually mm -hmm. learn. But I can memorize well, too. So mm -hmm. that's why I can do well in school. But I remember sitting in class just zoning out. I would just like look at the clock for hours. You know, it was not. And to be able to do that, to just push all of my needs to be doing something I enjoy aside because I'm supposed to do this. And then, you know, that's my whole entire childhood, just sitting in a chair, looking at a clock, like not being able to focus on what's like, want. it's like Charlie Brown, like they tell us what's happening. It's like, want, 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 want. That's for hours and hours a day, looking at the clock. And sure, I can memorize and, mm -hmm. and get an A on a test. Um, but that's not learning and that's not learning anything about myself and that's not even having you know any respect for my enjoyment right. of life for like that living life is a mm -hmm. celebration of bliss nobody is thinking about that with that it's just kind of this like right factory line and so yes and and that's I'm a girl so I can sit there and you know maybe I'm 
But for boys, I mean, for them to sit to sit for that long, boys really are even more active. I mean, even the girls, as we see homeschooling, like if we have a project, the girls will nap. Not all. It's also not right. like 100 percent. But like generally the girls can sit and do a project and do knitting. But these boys need to be running and jumping and screaming mm -hmm. and playing and wrestling mm -hmm. and and it's good for them. I just, you can see it's good for them to get that. And they, they do learn how to respect each other's boundaries that way over time, not right. at first, but over time they learn it. They learn lessons of like, oh, if I hit that hard, it hurts them. And yeah. then I feel bad. And then, oh, if they hit me, yeah. <laughs> this doesn't feel good. Yeah. So I'm not going to do that. And they're learning by playing and the boys, learn, you know, just they, they need to get that movement out. And then you see and hear stories of them actually just drugging the boys. They, oh, with the, yeah, with the they Adderall, drug right? them. Yeah. I mean, they, first it's, they all have labels. And I even know really so many like really wonderful, smart men who still have, I can feel it. Like when they talk about it, have this like ache, well, I'm dyslexic, you know, and like, oh, well, I have ADHD and that's why I'm a problem. And I've had to, you know, and it's kind of like now what the there's programs like read write that one uh, that a t one of the teachers we work with is taking right now and she's going through it and she's learning that like dyslexia is probably not even a thing like it's not like what they say it is it's the way they teach is in a way that causes it to be difficult for some mm. children to 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 read and so it's not even the problem with the child. I also think <laughs> too, the they, they sometimes teach. they developmentally just try to do it too early, you know? Absolutely, and, and, for some. Yeah. And absolutely it's too early. I mean, that's, I really like the Waldorf philosophy. They wait until seven to do anything. Mm. Sure, some kids can do it earlier. A lot of the girls can do it earlier generally than the boys. Um, but you wait until they're seven. They're kind of already at seven mm -hmm. and you let them start reading and then they just take off and they enjoy it when you don't push it on them. And that's so that's a, something for me is like I want the children to do things and to learn because there's like a spark in their heart that kind of drives them. Mm -hmm. And it's really that's my the world. That's my vision is for children to grow up doing things because there's a spark in their heart, not because an adult's going to tell right. them they're good. I, I want them to feel that because I think that that is it. It's like, it's the difference between like a heaven and hell on earth to be mm. living from a spark in your heart as opposed to be living because somebody external says that you're good or bad. And so that, so that's kind of the basic philosophy yeah. of that. And I think when we talk about it, some people can get the impression that it's like, oh, the kids are just running around doing whatever they want all day. But I think that there is a great balance between that unstructured play and children being able to find their comfort level and when they're ready to do something and then structured lessons and expectations of uh, their academic base goals. Well, I think you'll find even, I think that that's true how we've been doing yeah. it. I think in the homeschool community, you'll find a broad range mm -hmm. of some people truly unschool. And believe it or not, they don't, the kids never sit down and do a worksheet and they still go to college and they still learn because they just learn. I talked to this old school homeschool woman who's a wonderful lady and her children now are, you know, in our community homeschooling. And I said, well, what curriculum did you use? And she was like, curriculum. curriculum. Like, we didn't use the curriculum. I'm like, well, how did they learn? They just learn. So you say, every, you know, people with their, like, you know, your kids, the kids are going to learn. And so uh, I thought that was really interesting. And I really lean towards that. Mm. I wouldn't mind if I had found, a, you know, a community of just unschoolers but the truth is I have a husband and it, it, more importantly, I think even than that, I have a son who was like, mom, I want to learn. Mm. He likes to go and be like, I'm doing, you know, yeah. he's I can nine, do timetables. And he's like, I can... I can, I'm doing seventh grade math. And yeah. he, that feels good to him. That is his own spark in his heart that wants that. He learns it. He loves it. He does well. And he, he's building confidence. And so I support him in that. That's not 
my choice. I wouldn't mind us being out in nature all day. I wouldn't mind us just sitting by the river and like, yeah. like running around all day. I think that that is nice. And I, I do still think children learn. You can still learn to read and write fairly easily. And he really with the mathematics, because he's so good at it, a lot of it, amazingly, he did really learn on his own. Mm -hmm. He would start just, you know, seeing things different mm -hmm. places and learn on his own. And so, um, but, but what we do, I think, you know, in a community, there's still, uh, we, you still, you know, even in the homeschool mm -hmm. community, I want him to have peers and I want him to be learning with people and he wants to learn a certain way. And so we've set it up where it's like, there's free time. And then, well, you know, I don't, I have taught him some things, but I am not right at this point, like doing his teaching. Mm -hmm. I hire someone to do the teaching. I mean, it's, People, I sometimes think I think they think of homeschooling as not good, and I think of homeschooling as like like a luxury. I mean, and I, and I think that, well, I don't, I don't know. It's it's different because some people, I I some people I hear them talk about homeschooling, and I would even say it like, well, I have this privilege, you know, that I don't work and am able to do it. And then some people are like, yeah, I can't because I, you know, am you know, a single mom or like, I have to work. But then, you know, there are people like you and you're working and you're still fine. You're still doing yeah, it. Yeah. You got to figure it out. So people can figure it out. Right. Not That's just, you know, you can figure yeah, it we out. We have and a variety of in the people community. Yeah. that some work full time, some work part time, some don't, you know, the mom doesn't work and the dad does. And um, we have different situations and we've all decided that we want to prioritize our children being in this space. And so we make sacrifices or whatever you want to call it, adjust our lifestyle around this. Instead of doing my life around the public school and what they're doing, I've decided this is my priority. And we help, we help each other exactly. out all the time. So grateful. And it's, so it's, is a you know, mm -hmm. and grateful. Yeah. And it's a, com it's a community. And so, and just as, you know, you're grateful because I host things mm -hmm. and then I'm grateful for people coming and you helped me too. That just yesterday you right. helped me with, I had an appointment and you came. Came in. And so, in. yeah, exactly. so we are helping each other and it's a real community. So we really pulled my son out of school because of the mask, but we kept him out because uh, just the benefits of it. It feels like the right, it feels like the way we're supposed to raise our children, we're supposed to be with them, we're supposed to be aware of what they're learning, uh, we're supposed to have a say in what we're learning, it goes back to that, like, God gave me this child to, to teach him, because he trusted me, and, and I want to be the one who's raising my child, I don't necessarily trust this government enough to give my child over to them, to let them, you know, some, I was listening to a homeschool mom today, her, um, account is best of Connecticut moms. And she was saying when she would drop her kids off, it's like she gets prison vibes. And it is, it's where they're like, they won't let you in and they lock, they literally like lock them away. Even the buses look a lot like prison buses. And so there is a little- just institutionalization. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's I don't just... trust this government enough to send my child to them. Right. I'm not gonna give the, my child away to them. I have one child, I wanna raise him. And so it was just learning those things. You start with the propaganda with the masks. There's other propaganda. There's questionable sexual education stuff going on with children. I don't think teachers should be talking to children about sex. That's creepy to me. I think that it, it the parents or the, the, have the, ha, should make the decisions on how and when their children learn about those things. Those are, those are personal and those are private. And for the, the teachers to think that right. that's appropriate to talk to young children about sex is a little sick in my opinion. Right. I, I think it started with good intentions where there's going to be some kids who are in homes that either they don't learn those things or they're abusive. And, and that's true. It will always be true. But the difference is that when you do it as a government, you can do it at scale and with the power of the law versus in individual circumstances. Well, I wonder, I mean, I know they give the, I know they give those reasons because there are, this is another thing. Most people are good. I don't think there are people out there being bad and trying, you know, the people in the school systems, I don't think that they're, they're bad people right. at all. I think they, 
they have good intentions yeah. and they get a messaging that like pulls on their heartstrings. Yeah. Like, oh, we need to do, you need to teach the children about anal sex because, you know, Timmy's parents aren't going to talk to him about it. And like, the, I think they take a good meaning person and they tell them a story um, I, you know, that makes them think that it's okay. But then also sometimes, and, and they're so trusting of the government, but now it's like with what happened in 2020 and, and a lot of other things that happen, it's kind of like time to take a step back and be like, okay, maybe their story that's pulling on my heartstrings isn't why they're doing that. Right. And maybe we need to be thinking critically about like what, yeah. the heck is going on. I mean, it gets hard when your paycheck <laughs> is tied up in that system, though, and that's how you Not, were saying yeah, yeah, you felt absolutely. like God put you in a, um, the pandemic was your opportunity to pull your son out. I feel like, for me, it was a little bit after, it was the mandates for for the vaccine that that was my uh, my opportunity to come out of the system. Yeah. And, and I mean, I don't like to look, I think the pandemic was horrible in so many ways. So many people got addictions and bad health and not from COVID, from being sedentary from and locked mandates. in your homes yeah, and all from that. from the mandates and you know, the fear. Exactly. Fear causes fear. illness. So I, it was like my, you know, there was horrible things that happened, but there's that silver lining and I did feel like God almost gave me that blessing to be able to say like, hey, you can stay in this system for the next 20 years of your life and have all of your retirement and benefits and everything wrapped up in it, or you can f follow me and we're going to figure this out. And, and I feel very blessed to have had this opportunity to remake my life and be with my son and have this community here. And I was a teacher and I feel like that is an advantage in certain ways, but I also feel like anybody can be a teacher. Anybody can rebuild their lifestyle to homeschool their kid, no matter what kind of job you have. Maybe you have to switch jobs. Maybe you have to switch shifts. Maybe you have to switch companies. Maybe, you know, one of you has to work during the day. One of you has to work in the night shift, whatever it is. Anybody can figure out how to make their lifestyle around homeschooling if they want to, and anybody can teach their child. Do you have to outsource some of it? Sure, right? I outsource some of my learning here. I ha we, have, we do chess lessons. We, we do fun little activities at museums and this and that. So I'm not always the teacher, but anybody can be that basic teacher. And, and be the one who decides, okay, this is the person who I trust to teach this thing, not just the random teacher you were assigned to for that subject at school. Yeah, it's a next level of involvement and really, and staying connected with your child. I, I see the indoctrination that happens. I almost feel like they switch it every generation to keep us divided. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think a few things. One, I think it's so admirable to see what you you did. It's just, we're in a time where I think people are starting to say like, hey, what's going on? And then, and then, and maybe, you know, we haven't been, we, you know, somehow escaped, maybe because I couldn't pay attention to those teachers, I escaped the indoctrination. And, you know, we're able to say like, what's right? And what can we do to follow what's right, not just sticking with the status quo because it's comfortable and that it's so important that we do that now because it's getting weird. It's getting weird if you stay asleep with it. And um, I know you say, I'll say something like, uh, you have to fear God more than you fear your opinions of your friends. But I know you you put it like you have to love God yeah. more than you care about the love of your friends, which I think works just the same. Or even for me, it's like yeah. love yourself. Love yourself Like more. love yourself, yeah. like what's coming from your heart. And also it's like, are they really your friend? Like who, if I'm just doing things to please everybody else, like do we really have a connection? Like I'm not being me. You don't like me because I'm not even telling you who I am like I think these things are a little off so I'm going to do something else that I choose you know and and I would hope that everybody can respect what everybody chooses and it really is about you know teaching liberty like it's freedom like freedom 
is so important. It's our freedom of religion, our freedom to raise our children how we would like to raise them, uh, our, you know, our freedom to follow what's in our hearts and, and be ourselves and accept each other. We don't have to like everything the other person does. And you're never going to find somebody that's exactly like you on every issue. And why would you want to? Like, you can just sit alone. Like, it's amazing to be able to build a community and to have friends. And so it, that's what's so important. And so, that, yeah, the, that freedom aspect mm -hmm. is And we really bring, important. everybody brings something you know, you, you bring the space and you put on these wonderful like ceremonies and you make tea and you do all these certain things. And our other friend, she does a lot of, um, she makes like soaps and uh, we have another friend who would bring the kids on hikes and identify different things. So it's really awesome when we can just all bring our things t together, all chip in and create this amazing community and I'm so excited for next year because we're going to be expanding and and uh, just really creating um, a more I don't know permanent kind of community instead of just going here and going there figuring out whose house it's going to be at yeah and, we're in the yeah. process of starting a church and there's a lot you know there's a lot of freedoms in that religion and and so we're going to bring our spirit, you know, the spirituality aspect into um, raising the children, mm -hmm. because I think that that is so important, especially when we have this technology, mm -hmm. this booming technology. And and one thing I just always think of is like just to teach the children core values and morals, because what if all the politicians had integrity? What if that was valued in our culture? And when you have this technology coming out, that's that's, you know, it's becoming more and more advanced. It has to be balanced with the spirituality. Right, because it's so, it can be, it's like disassociating, right? It's like it almost takes you out of yourself in It's ways. a portal. I mean, yeah. I always think of the phone as a portal. Like, mm. it is a portal, and you can use it to go to hell, or you can use it to go to heaven. It's another place. It's your choice. You can choose suffering. You can choose the fear, or you can choose to create. And that's, I think, what we're doing is we're saying, this is getting weird. I don't choose that anymore. The, the people who are in power aren't, I don't agree with them anymore. I don't trust them. Mm -hmm. And so I'm an adult and I can create something that works for me, that works for my family, that works for my community. And that's what we keep doing. And so in the same thing, like, I don't love this content. It's too, it's a little too violent for me. It doesn't sit well with me. This is a little too sexual for children. There's some weird stuff getting snuck in that feels like grooming. Like, I don't like that. I'm going to create like my your own. own. Book. And that's what <laughs> you I know? love. This you is always, just the first one. You create you're... your own thing. And every, what if everyone started right. doing that? Like, what if everyone thought they could? There's mm. something also, I think, about homeschooling, what, where the children are going to watching us, they're watching mm -hmm. us create. They see and you. You come up with an idea. You're like, I'm going to do this thing, and, and they want to create. It. Yeah. And they're now they're creating their own. You know, mm -hmm. they create their own things. They start their little businesses, and they're creating and they're doing it from their hearts. And that's like what it's all about. I just love it. Like I love it. I love having my child be near me. I love knowing what's going on in his life. I love watching the boys run around, you know, and I love Do hearing their children laugh at the house. And... I love it. Yeah. So it is, it feels like how it's supposed to be. Uh, I think even before 2020, I would sit with the moms, you know, while the kids are playing. And it was like, I felt like we needed to have villages again, mm -hmm. where we, you know, when we have a baby, like our mom's there and our sister's there and our best friends growing from growing up and they're there to help us. And the children can just run to each other's houses. And if I have an appointment, I can go and there'll be other moms to help. And, you know, we live so far apart and we're so isolated and it makes it, it creates suffering where there doesn't need to be because having a community, having people to rely on really um, is a wonderful thing in life. And so, this the homeschooling and finding these communities and and helping each other out and being with our children and, and getting to hear them laugh is just it's just been such a blessing and so, so much yes. <laughs> and so so yeah it's just a wonderful way to live for that's how I choose to I'm choosing to raise my child so um yeah, so anyone. Yeah, I was going to say, like, if there's anybody out there who wants to learn more about homeschooling, 
Um, if you're in the area and you want to link in to what we're doing, if you want to grab a copy of the book, where can people like find you and reach out? So I have a Instagram page, Tulsi and Butterfly. You can, it's my personal page. You can reach me there uh, if you want to ask anything about homeschooling. I'm happy. I'm always happy. I love arranging things for homeschoolers. I love to bring people together. Uh, I love, you know, th there's always like, oh, with homeschooling, you don't get the socialization. Our kids are definitely getting the socialization and it's because we are helping each other. So if anyone's curious about this, feel free to give me a call or, or you know, DM me on my social media, Tulsi and Butterfly. And then also the book, if you, you know, this is hopefully, I'd love for this just to be the first one. So if you'd like to support this project, you can go, I have an Instagram page at uh, themostbeautifulbooks.com and there's a website, themostbeautifulbooks.com. And I'll, and I'll link those in the description so you can easily find them. And thank you guys for coming and checking this out. Thank you, Natalie, for sharing. Uh, and thank you so much for everything you do. I just, I feel truly blessed to have been able to find this community and such amazing people that are just willing to like open up their homes and share their heart with. So every, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for teaching Liberty. Thank you for being part of the community. It wouldn't, it, for me, I open my house to people because I want a community for my son. So it's only as great as the people in it. So I'm grateful for you too. And so let's keep, let's let's keep it, it up. And let's thank you guys it. out there. If you like this video, which I don't know why you wouldn't, make sure you hit the like button. If you're new, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, and we want to know what you're thinking. So let us know in the comments down below. Share this with your friends, your friend who's like, oh, I couldn't homeschool, I don't know. This is the video for them. And until next time, think free, live free, give all the glory to God.